Hello everyone and welcome back to another example video. In this example video we're going to be covering the virtual work method for Euler Bernoulli beams using the program Mathematica. Now if you guys have seen the video example for the Rayleigh Ritz method for Euler Bernoulli beams you guys will notice a lot of similarities between the Rayleigh Ritz method and the virtual work method. So the goal of this problem is to solve the beam shown down below on the right hand side. Now if we look at this beam, it's very unique in the sense that it has two loading conditions. The first is a distributed load Q over the length of the beam, and the second one is a point load P located at, at a distance D from the left support of the beam. Now if you guys remember the exact solution, this is actually kind of a pain in the ass because since we have that point load, it creates a discontinuity in our shear diagram. Therefore, if we were to analyze this beam using an exact solution or a differential equation, we would actually have to split up the domain into two parts, one for between 0 and D, and then the second one between D and L. Because, of course, that uh, discontinuity, we can't exactly solve it using the differential equation itself. We actually have to incorporate it as a boundary condition. Now, what's nice for us is when we deal with approximation methods, we don't really have to worry about this discontinuity at all. We can solve the displacement function of the beam as a single continuous function, which is great for us because it means less work. And this leads us to the first step that we're going to have to do in this method. We have to define our approximation function. So I'm going to create a section here, and I'm simply just going to call it approximation function. And there we can define whatever approximation function that we want. So the variable I'm going to use for the approximation function is simply going to be y approx. And we can set it to basically anything that we like. Now, typically polynomials are selected for these approximation functions, and that's what I'm going to use. In particular, since we have Mathematica and we have all this computational power we can take advantage of, I'm going to select a sixth order polynomial. So I'm going to have a0 plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared, et cetera, et cetera, until I get it to be sixth order. So I'm going to cut the video until I'm done all the typing and we'll continue on from there. All right, now that I'm finished adding my terms, I can go shift enter to run the code. I can see that our approximation is simply a naught plus a1 times x1 plus a2 times x1 squared plus a3 times x1 cubed, etc., etc. Now the whole goal of these approximation methods is to solve for these a coefficients. So if we look here, the x1 variable, well, that's just going to be x1. That doesn't really change. So it's a0, a1, a2, a3, etc. that we want to solve for. Once we know all of those a coefficients, we actually have our approximation function. So that's going to be the goal here. So I'm going to suppress this just to get it off the screen. And we can go into the first step. Now, the first step of the virtual work method is actually the same as the rayleigh ritz method, as well as all the other approximation methods out there. And that is satisfying the essential boundary conditions. So I'm going to just call this essential boundary conditions. And basically what this is, is we have to make sure that our approximation equation satisfies all the boundary conditions related to rotation as well as displacement. Now, if we look at our particular beam here, we see that on the left hand side, the beam is fixed. Therefore, the displacement and the rotation at x1 is equal to zero. Well, it's going to be zero because of that fixed support. Now, since these have to do with displacement as well as rotation, these are considered essential boundary conditions, and we have to make sure that our approximate function that we defined above satisfies these conditions. So what I like to do is I just like to type in what exactly these boundary conditions are going to be. And we said the first one, which I'll call boundary condition one, this has to do with the displacement at x1 is equal to zero. So I'm going to take my approximation function, and I'm going to substitute the value of x1 is equal to zero. So I'm going to say x1 is equal to zero, and if I were to run this, I simply get a naught, which makes sense because all of these terms that contain x1, well, they're going to go to zero once I substitute x1 is equal to zero. Now, the second one we also have, so I'm going to go boundary condition two, we know is the rotation at x1 is equal to zero. Now, it's not entirely clear how we do this, but if you guys remember back to when we we're dealing with exact solutions, stuff like that, we know that the rotation function is simply the derivative of our deflection function. So to get the rotation function, all I'm going to do is take the derivative of our approximation function. And to do that, we are going to use the D function in Mathematica. So the D function, it's very simple. I just type uppercase D and inside the brackets, I input two things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate these two things with a comma. 
And the first one is going to be, what is the function I want to take the derivative of? Well, I know I want to take the derivative of my approximation function. The second part in the other side of the bracket is, what do you want to differentiate with respect to? Well, I know I'm taking the derivative of our approximation function with respect to x1. So on this side, I would simply put x1, <laughs> not explanation mark, but x1. And if I were to run this, I actually get the derivative of that function. Now, as we can see, it's still in terms of x1. And we know that our boundary condition occurs specifically when x1 is equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute x1 is equal to 0 in this equation. And I simply get a 1. Now, it's very, very obvious that a0 and a1 are going to be equal to 0 because these boundary conditions are going to be equal to 0. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the code to solve for them really quick. So I'm going to go solve, and I'm going to do this using the solve function. Solve function is very nice. It's just solve, and inside of our square brackets, we input two arguments. So I'm going to separate those two arguments with a comma. And the first one over here is what are our equations? So since we have more than one equation, we have to input squiggle brackets. This is what you do if you want to input more than one thing. And we know that we have two equations, and that is my boundary condition 1, which is the displacement at x1 is equal to 0. Well, we know that's going to be equal to 0. The second one that we have is our boundary condition 2, which is the rotation at x1 is equal to 0. Well, we know this is also equal to 0. So there's two equations. And since I have two equations, it means I can solve for two unknowns. So in the second argument over on the other side, I'm going to put another squiggle bracket. And this is where I want to input what unknowns I want to solve for. So for this particular case, I'm solving for a0 as well as a1. So if I were to suppress these top two functions, because we don't need to see their output and just show the solve, it says that a0 is actually equal to 0, as well as a1 is equal to 0, which is perfect. That's exactly what we expected. And you're saying, Clayton, why didn't you just put a0 is equal to 0 and a1 is equal to 0? It's pretty obvious to see. Well, let's say that this fixed support was on the right-hand side. So instead of equal to 0, this actually occurs at x1 is equal to L. If I were to run this right now, it still solves for a0 as well as a1. It just gets a little bit messier since it's not exactly equal to 0. So if it's equal to 0, it's very easy just to say a1 and a0 are equal to 0. But if we input the code in this particular way, it takes into account the fact that the boundary condition can be on the left or the right. So that's why I do it. So I'm going to set these back equal to 0 because that's our current boundary conditions. And the last thing that we're going to do before we move on is just store the variables. Because if I were to go a0 right now, well, it's still a0. So we have to make sure that Mathematica knows a0 as well as a1 they're actually equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a0 as well as a1. Well, these are equal to a0 and a1, specifically when the solution above. Oops, not 1, 1, <laughs> just 1. So now we have successfully stored a0 and a1 as 0. So if I were to come down here again and just go a0, it has it equal to 0. And that's, oops, <laughs> that's not what we wanted. Good thing we had that, uh, that control Z. All right, so that's going to be the essential boundary condition. So I'm just going to run it to get it off the screen. And if we look up at our approximation function, we can see that we've actually made some progress. In Mathematica, something that is blue is undefined. However, since a0 as well as a1 are now black, this means that they are actually defined, which is good. Because remember, the whole goal here is to solve for those a coefficients. Now, if we look kind of further down the equation, we still see that a2 a3, a4, a5, and a6, well, they're still blue, meaning that they are actually unknown. So we are actually going to have to solve those using an alternative way than the essential boundary conditions. And this is exactly where the method of virtual work comes in. So we're going to use the method of virtual work to solve for a2, a3, a4, a5, etc. So the question becomes, where do we begin in the method of virtual work? For the Rayleigh-Ritz method, it was actually very easy to see where we start and how we're able to obtain these coefficients. For the method of virtual work, it's a little bit more tricky. Now, if we were to look at the equations for virtual work, we're going to see a common thing. And I'm going to pull up the equations once we start coding them, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. All of the equations for virtual work contain something called the virtual displacement function. Now, if we look up above here, we have an approximate displacement function but we actually don't have a virtual displacement function. So that's going to be the first thing that we're going to want to define. So I'm going to create a section called virtual displacement 
function. Nice and easy. And defining the virtual displacement function is also nice and easy. Because what we do in the method of virtual work is we assume that our virtual displacement function is the same as our approximate solution, or sorry, our approximate function above, with the only difference is, is we're going to replace all of our A coefficients, so A2, A3, A4, etc., with virtual coefficients. You're saying, Clayton, what exactly does this mean? Well, if I were to go my approximate solution right now, we can see that we have A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a virtual displacement function, which I'm going to call Y star, and it's going to be equal to my approximate solution, but I'm going to replace each one of those A coefficients with the virtual coefficient. So I'm going to take A2, and then I'm going to replace it with A2 star. I'm going to take A3, and I'm going to replace that with A3 star. Similarly, A4, I'm going to replace with A4 star, and I'm going to do this all the way throughout. So if we look here, all you can see is that I took our approximate displacement function, and I switched all of our A coefficients with virtual coefficients. So if I were to run this now, we can see that above here we have our approximate one, which is simply A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. And down here we have our virtual one, which is A2 star, A3 star, A4 star, A5 star, A6 star, etc., etc. So even though the virtual displacement function sounds a little bit complicated, it's actually very easy to obtain once we have an approximation function that satisfies the essential boundary conditions. And that's the key here is remember that at this point right here, we have satisfied those essential boundary conditions. Therefore, we don't have a naught or a one. So when it comes time to define our virtual displacement function, it will also satisfy those essential boundary conditions because we're basing it off of a function that already satisfies those conditions. So I'm going to suppress that right there and we can move on to the next step. So if you guys remember the Rayleigh Ritz method, this is where it becomes very similar. In the Rayleigh Ritz method, we dealt with something internally, which was the strain energy, and we dealt with something externally, which was the applied loads. Now, the method of virtual work, we're going to do the exact same thing, except instead of strain energy, we call it the internal virtual work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to find a section called the internal virtual work. And as you guys may guess, later on, we're going to define the external virtual work. But right now, we're going to do the internal virtual work. Now, it sounds really crazy. Internal virtual work, you're expecting something pretty gross. However, it's actually very nice. As you guys can see in the formula down there on the right, the internal virtual work is simply the integral over the length of the beam of our flexural rigidity multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function and then multiplied by the second derivative of our virtual displacement function. And this is nice because even though it sounds really bad, we've actually defined our approximation function as well as our virtual function. So we have everything that we actually need to define this internal virtual work. So I'm going to call it IVW. I don't know why I always go E for some reason, but IVW, the internal virtual work, we know it's an integral. So we're going to use the integrate function right here. And the integrate function takes into arguments, much like the other functions that we've used. So we're going to separate those by a comma. The first one is what is the function we want to integrate? And the second one, of course, is going to be what is the domain? So we're going to start off with the domain. It's always nice and easy. So I'm going to put squiggle brackets. And if we're thinking about it for integrating, what are we integrating with respect to? Well, we know we're integrating with respect to x1. And we want to integrate over the length of the beam. So we're going from x1 is equal to 0 all the way until x1 is equal to L. So the domain, nice and easy. The function that we're integrating, also very easy because we just need to substitute our formula into here. So we know that we have our flexural rigidity term, EI, multiplied by the second derivative of our approximation function. We said that derivatives can be captured using the D function in Mathematica. So this will take a derivative. And we said that this d function takes in two arguments. The first one is, what is the function we want to take the derivative of? Well, that's simply our approximation function. And the second argument here is, what variable do you want to take the derivative with respect to? Well, that's simple. That's going to be x1. Now, we have a problem right here is because the way that this is right now, this will only take the derivative of our approximation function once. But if we look at our equation here, we actually want the second derivative of that approximation function. Now this is where coding comes into play. You guys have many different options. You guys want to make sure that you have a second derivative. 
If you guys really want, you guys can do the D function yet again to the, our current D function to take that second derivative. But Mathematica is actually very nice in that it accounts for the possibilities of taking the derivatives more than once. How do we do that? Well, in our second argument here, we're actually going to put squiggles around the x1. We're going to add a comma, and then we add 2. So what this does right here is this specifies the amount of times you want to take the derivative of that function. So right now I say I'm going to take the derivative of our approximation function with respect to x1 twice. Nice and easy. If I wanted to do it five times for whatever reason, I would just replace that with a 5. Nice and easy. So that's that term right there. And as we can see, moving down the list, we have one final term, which is the derivative of our virtual displacement function. So this is going to be y star. And again, we're going to take the derivative with respect to x1, and we're going to do it twice. So this right here is going to be our internal virtual work. So if I go shift enter to C, it takes a little while because, of course, it's a big, disgusting integral. And as we can see, the resulting equation is an absolute mess. We have a2. We have a3, we have a4, a5, a6, etc. But we also have a2 star, a3 star, a4 star, etc., etc. So in this current state right here, it actually has 10 unknowns, five of the non-virtual coefficients and five of the virtual coefficients. And how we actually solve this equation, that's what's actually going to lead to a lot of problems with students. I, I find that calculating the internal virtual work and the external virtual work, uh, nice and easy. Students don't have a problem with that. It's solving the equations afterwards that uh, <laughs> causes a little bit of problems. But for now, we're not going to worry about it too much. So I'm going to suppress it so we don't have to see it. And we're going to move on to the next section. So again, I've already kind of hinted that in addition to internal virtual work, we also have something called external virtual work. So I'm going to go external virtual work. And this is the work done on the system by the external forces. Now, remember that when we did work done on a system in the Rayleigh-Ritz method, we took our forces and we multiplied them by displacements. We're going to do the exact same thing here, as you guys can see by the equation. The only key here to remember is that when we're multiplying by the displacements, we're going to multiply them by the virtual displacements. So I'm going to say my external virtual work, uh, and actually I'll go one, because as we can see, we have two components that it is going to contribute to the external virtual work. The first one is going to be the distributed load. And the second one is going to be our point load. So our first external virtual work term, we'll say that this is the distributed load Q. So all we're going to do is we're going to integrate Q over the length of the beam while it's multiplied by that virtual displacement. So to integrate, we know that we use the integrate function and we know we have to input two things into this function. So the, the second part, the easy part is the domain while we're integrating over the length of the beam. So I'm going to go from X1 is equal to zero all the way until X1 is equal to L. Now, the first part here, this is what is the function that we want to integrate. Well, we know we're taking our distributed load Q and we're multiplying this by our virtual displacement. So we're going to multiply Q by Y star. A very common mistake students will make is they'll multiply Q by our approximate displacement function. We don't do that. We're multiplying it by a virtual displacement function. And that's it. It's actually nice and easy. So if I were to go shift enter, we can see we have the first term of our external virtual work, nice and easy. So I'm going to suppress that to get rid of it. And we're going to come down here. Oops. <laughs> we're going to come down here and we're going to work on the second term. So we're going to say external virtual work two. And this is going to be the external virtual work due to that point load. And it's actually nice and easy. It's simply the point load multiplied by the displacement at that point load. So we're going to take our point load P and we're going to multiply it by the displacement at that point load. So we're going to multiply it by Y star now, I said it twice, but I really want to emphasize this is the displacement at that point load. This isn't P multiplied by our displacement function or a virtual displacement function. It is P multiplied by our virtual displacement function at the location of the point load. So we know that the point load occurs at a distance D from the left support. So I'm going to put this specifically happens when X1 is equal to D. If you guys forget this x1 is equal to d and just multiply it by the virtual displacement function, well, we're going to get some problems. But if you guys remember, as we can see, it actually looks pretty easy. So if I were to run this nice, easy output, we can move forward. So I'm going to suppress it to get rid of it. And then we can say, all right, well, our total external virtual work is simply the summation of the virtual work of each of the terms. So we're going to take external virtual work one, which is from the distributed load, 
and we're going to add it to the external virtual work external virtual work two term from the point load. So our total external virtual work is going to be equal to this. So again, it's looking pretty gross. We have a bunch of virtual coefficients. So a two star, a three star, a four star, a five star. Now, a little bit of a tip or a trick, if you will. Notice that when we're looking at our a coefficients here in the external virtual work, they are all virtual coefficients, a five star, a three star, et cetera, et cetera. We have no real A coefficients in here. We only have virtual. So if you guys get your external virtual work and you have your regular A coefficients, such as A2, A3, well, you did something wrong. And this makes sense because if we look at the formulas for both, we only multiply by the virtual displacement field in both of these scenarios. So again, that's just a little bit of a tip or a trick to make sure that you guys are on the right track. So now that we've done the external virtual work, we can get into the fun stuff which is the principle of virtual work. So I'm going to go shift enter here and I'm going to come down and I'm going to say the principle principle of virtual work. Now the principle of virtual work is actually very, very simple. However, solving for the equations using the principle of virtual work, that's where things get a little bit hairy. So I'm going to actually scroll down a little bit so we can keep most of the screen intact. And that is this. A principle of virtual work, nice and simple, it's simply the summation of the internal virtual work, which we have defined above right here, is going to be equal to the summation of the external virtual work, which we have defined up here. So we have our internal virtual work, and we know that this is going to be equal to our external virtual work. So we have an equation, basically. But the problem becomes is we have one equation, but we have currently 10 unknowns. We have a2, a2 star, a3, a3 star, a4, a4 star, etc, etc. So the question becomes, how can we solve for these 10 coefficients using only one equation? So here's the secret. The coefficients in front of the virtual coefficients of the external virtual work must be equal to the coefficient in front of the virtual coefficients of the internal virtual work. Now you may be saying, Clayton, I don't know what the hell you just said. I don't blame you. This is one of those things that it's very hard to show using computer programs. Therefore, if you guys are struggling with this concept, I recommend going and watching my video in which I solved this problem. Of course, with lesser terms, I couldn't do six order, <laughs> but I solved this problem by hand and you guys can see exactly what I mean by this. What do I mean by this? Well, if I were to come down here and go coefficient of our external virtual work of A2 star, so simply this, this is the coefficient in front of a2 star from the external virtual work term. I can do the exact same thing for the internal virtual work term. So I go internal virtual work of a2 star, and I get this equation right here. Now, because of the principle of virtual work, we know that these two coefficients actually must be equal to each other. So this right here, that's actually equal to this, and this creates an equation. Now, this only creates one equation, but we only did it for a2 star. If we were to repeat this same process for a3 star, a4 star, a5 star, and a6 star, we actually get five equations for five unknowns. Because one of the things that you'll notice here is the coefficient in front of a2 star in the internal virtual work, it's just a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6. There is nothing virtual in that coefficient. And the same thing for the external virtual work. We are simply just given the parameters of our beam. We actually don't have any virtual coefficients in either one of these. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start defining my equations. And we said that if they are equal to each other, well, I can move one to the other side and make it equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the coefficient of the external virtual work of A2 star, and I'm going to subtract it from the coefficient of the internal virtual work uh, IBW <laughs> of A2 star. Now, remember, this creates one equation, and because of the principle of virtual work, we know that this equation is actually going to be equal to zero. And we're going to repeat the same process with every virtual coefficient. So I just did it for A2 star. I'm going to come down here, and I'm going to create my five equations that I need. So I'm just going to relabel these equations. This will be two, equation three, equation four, equation five. And instead of a2 star, well, we know that we're doing that with a3 star in this equation. The next equation, we're going to do it with a4 star. The next equation, we are going to do it with a5 star. And finally, the last equation, we are going to do it with a6 star. Now, again, I know this is extremely confusing if you've never seen this before. 
So I highly recommend you guys watch the video where I solve it by hand. It makes much more sense of what exactly is happening when you solve it by hand. So I'm going to unsuppress these really quick and just run them. And as we can see, we now have five equations for five unknowns. We have a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6, and that's it. As we can see, there is no virtual coefficients in any of these equations. So we technically have five unknowns now, and we have five equations. Therefore, we can solve the system. So I'm going to suppress all these again, just get them off of the screen. And to solve the system, we simply use our solve function, just like before. So I'm going to go solve. The first argument, that is, what are our equations? Well, we know equation 1, that's going to be equal to 0. We have equation 2, also equal to 0. Equation 3, equal to 0. Equation 4, equal to 0. And finally, equation 5 is equal to 0. Now, since we've inputted five equations, we can solve for five unknowns, which is perfect because we only have five unknowns. Those are a2, a3, a4, a5, and a6. So again, five equations, five unknowns. If I were to run this bad boy, we can see that we have now solved for a2, a3, a4, a5, as well as a6. Now, just like the Rayleigh-Ritz method, they're disgusting right now. And of course, they're disgusting because we left them as just random parameters, such as the length L, the point load P, the distance D, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't provide any numerical values for any of these parameters. So we are going to uh, address that in just a second. The last thing that we need to do really quick is just define our parameters because, again, if I were to go A2 right now, well, it just gives me A2. So I actually have to define what A2 is as well as the other ones. So I'm going to go A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6. Well, we know this is going to be equal to A2, A3, A4, A5, and A6, specifically when the solution occurs. So now that they are defined, if I were to suppress this and I were to simply just call A2, I know exactly what a2 is equal to. Now, of course, again, it's really gross because we didn't define any of those being parameters such as d, p, uh, l, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're, what we're going to do is we are going to look at the validity of our solution. Because if I wanted to right now and I were to call upon our approximate solution, we have our approximate solution. It's right here. Of course, it looks really gross. So the question becomes, how good is this approximate solution? Is it the right approximate solution? Is it very off? Well, we don't really know. So the first thing that I'm actually going to do is I'm going to come up here and I'm going to define some of these parameters. So I'm going to create a section and I'm going to simply call it parameters. Now, we're just going to go through the list of all the parameters we need for our approximation solution and just add values to them or uh, define values for them. So the first one is the length of the beam. Uh, let's say that it is six. D, the distance from the left side to the point load, let's say that that is 4. We also have the elastic modulus, let's say that this is 20 million. We have the moment of inertia IG, let's say that this is 0 0.003, so let's go 3 divided by 1000. I'll show you guys why I do that in a second. Uh, the last thing left is going to be our load, so let's say we have a distributed load of negative 45 and a point load of 100. So now I've defined all the parameters, but I have to be careful because one of the things that I did down here in the internal virtual work is I defined the flexural rigidity EI as one single parameter. So what I have to do up here before running the code, I have to define EI. Well, that's simply the Young's modulus, which we defined right here, multiplied by the moment of inertia, which again, we've defined up here. So I can just add that semicolon. We are good to go. If I were to come down here, our approximate solution is now much nicer. It's just a function of x1, which is exactly what we want. Now, some of you guys may be wondering, why did I define the moment of inertia as a fraction? Well, basically, if you input all of your parameters in Mathematica as fractions and whole numbers, your final solution will be in terms of fractions and whole numbers. If I were to come up here and uh, input this as a decimal form. So I'm just going to delete this really quick. And I were to go 0 0.003. This is the exact same thing as the fraction. And I were to run it. Well, then our final answer is now in terms of decimals. Now, decimals can be great sometimes, but sometimes they're pretty ugly. I personally like to keep everything in fractions. So that's why I put everything in fractions because my final answer will always be in terms of a fraction. Nice, clean looking solution, at least in my opinion. Again, you guys can pick 
whatever you guys want. So now that we have our equation kind of defined for a very particular scenario, the question still stands. How good of an approximation is this? So what we're going to do to kind of test the validity of this virtual work method as well as our approximation is we're going to compare it to the exact solution. I'm going to solve for the exact solution really quick and I'll see you guys after I'm done typing it in. All right, guys, when I ran the code, something was a little bit off <laughs> and I realized that when I specified the parameters, I had our point load P as a positive value, which means that the point load was acting upwards. Now, of course, since we're interested in point load that acts downwards, I simply added the negative sign. So there's something I just wanted to clarify a little bit. If you guys are typing the code uh, along with me, you guys will get a little bit of an error. And that's because, again, the point load was pointing upwards. So we simply add the negative sign to indicate that it is indeed going downwards. All right, so I just wanted to clarify that really quick. And now scrolling down, this is the section that I added here. Uh, the first thing that I did was I found our approximate shear and our approximate moment functions. Again, if we have a deflection function, we know that there is a nice relationship between this deflection function to our moment function and to our shear function. So all I did to find the shear was I took EI, our flexural rigidity, and I multiplied it by the third derivative of our approximation function. And then similarly for moment, I took EI and then multiplied it by the second derivative of our approximate deflection function. And this will provide additional comparisons as we'll see down below. So scrolling down, I added the exact solution. So if you guys are unsure of how I obtained the exact solution, please just look around. I have a video showing you guys exactly how I do this. And then down here, I just decided for comparison purposes, uh, let's plot the functions. It's best to see uh, the, the actual plots because if I were to just compare two equations in equation form, it's very hard to see uh, how well they represent one another. So I'm going to scroll down to our actual plots and we can see that if we compare the deflection obtained from the exact solution to the deflection obtained from the approximation, well, they're basically the same. You don't see any major differences whatsoever. Therefore, we can conclude that A, the virtual work method, very powerful method and very good at approximating things, and B, that our six order polynomial was sufficient enough to actually approximate this exact solution. However, if we scroll down to the moment plot, we can see that like before, there is a very good, uh, there is very good accuracy with the approximation. However, at the point of discontinuity, where we have that point load, the exact solution and the approximation are a little bit different, but not too bad. So overall, still a very good approximation. However, there's a little bit of error around that discontinuity. However, once we get to shear, we can see that overall, over the length of the beam, the approximation and the exact solution, they're a little bit different. And by a little bit different, I mean at the supports, we see that there is glaring issues. And especially around the point of discontinuity, there is also uh, a lack of accuracy. And the reason for this is because we approximated this displacement function as one simple continuous function. But we know that in actuality, it is a discontinuous function. We have two regions that we had to define. So this is one of the limitations of providing one single continuous function over the length of the beam for our approximation is that it fails to capture any sort of discontinuities like we have in the shear right here. And that's basically it for this video, guys. So thank you guys all so much for listening. I hope I was able to uh, provide you with some sort of knowledge. I know sometimes it's hard, especially with virtual work. It's uh, I know it's not the, the most fun of topics, but uh, I hope I made it uh, a little bit easier for you guys. <laughs> so yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.